That makes sense. Yeah. Here, we love to have a good time. We love to have fun. And so, uh, I was expecting somebody to get one of the lighters out, like her own phone, you know, and start, you know, uh, getting into the vibe and getting into the groove. But, you know, when you start thinking about what it's going to be like in heaven, and we know we think about not just heaven where we go when we die, but have you ever thought that when two or more are gathered together, we're actually, it says, Jesus is there with us, that we bring heaven to us? Think about that. When we meet together here as a church, that heaven can actually come down to us. And that's really, man, it just blows my mind just to grasp that. But the, today we're going to be talking about what is this church is kind of all about. We've been talking about small groups. I am excited about launching small groups. As you leave here today, you'll see some tables set up with some of our small group leaders. It's really the heartbeat of who we are is finding that group that you belong to. Finding the, those people who are going to love you no matter what. They're going to love you in the good times. They're going to love you uh, in the hard times and the bad times. This is going to be the group that helps you through their troubles. Uh, last night, all the life group leaders, we, we just met together at my house. We we had a cookout. We we had kids. Uh, they took uh, the cornhole and turned it into a dodgeball game. Still not sure how that even happened. But if you knew our kids, you would understand. But we, we really had a dream, and we really prayed together about what could we do to have this place be so special that everyone uh, comes together, everyone is loved, everyone finds their place. When you came in, I really need everyone to make sure that you have a puzzle piece. Okay? So make sure that you have a puzzle piece. It'll make more sense. Okay? So if you did not get a puzzle piece, uh, we'll have our ushers come and they're back there in the back. Make sure that you get a puzzle piece. Also, um, uh, Sheila Potter with our preschool ministry. Okay? She's going to come. She's got an announcement and then we're going to have a greeting, uh, a little bit of greeting time as you guys come in. Good morning everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Sheila Potter. I'm the children's uh, ministry coordinator here at the Bridgewater Town. Um, right now we are looking uh, for some volunteers to start serving in our children's ministry team. Um, we need help in all areas. Stand in the middle here. Um, our preschool area is called Waypoints. Uh, our younger elementary area is called The Zone and merges our upper elementary areas. And we are really looking for parents to consider serving. If they haven't had the time to do it before and you have the time now, we would really love for you guys to sign up. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say was that we have basically some children's ministry facts. Uh, all you need is a willing heart to serve. Um, a lot can happen in our world if we just have a willing heart. Uh, we'll help make it easy for you. Uh, it's like plug and play. Uh, you go ahead downstairs and we're up in the waypoints area and we'll have all the stuff that you need to do what you need to do that day. We'll have all the prep work ready for you. You just have to review some things before you come in and you're good to go. Uh, the other great point about uh, serving in children's ministry is that it's a fun way to get to know people. Uh, by the way, you guys have such wonderful kids. Um, I have really, really enjoyed getting to know the children uh, and the adults that serve in the area there. Um, it has been just a wonderful experience for me since I started to really feel plugged in here um, at the bridge. Um, so we encourage you to come sign up for that now. We really have a great need. Um, children are important to God and they really should be important to us here at Watertown. Uh, he says in Proverbs 22.6, uh, train up a child in the way he should go and even when he is old he will not depart from it. That's really what we want for our children. We want them to follow the Lord all the days of their life with all their heart. Um, Matthew 19, 14 says, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So if you can't serve but you know someone else who is not serving in an area, pull them alongside you and, and encourage them to serve. Um, 
for more information about serving, you can see me uh, at the waypoints table off the lobby or Janice downstairs in the zone and merge area. Uh, last thing is that baby dedications um, are in November 10th. Uh, if you are interested in doing that, please see TJ or myself and we'll get you set up with that. Um, if you guys are currently serving, I just want to thank you so much uh, for everyone who's serving on every team. We really could not do it without you. That's it. Thanks. All right. Well, I really want to thank you guys. Thank you guys. Also, if you are a first-time guest after the service, if you'll fill out your Connect card and come and see me at the Purple Tent, I would love to give you a free gift. Um, again, we like to have fun here. So one of the things that we like to do, we like to kick it off with a little bit of just kind of a party atmosphere. So the band's going to play a little fun song where you guys stand and greet one another. Thank you guys for making this uh, one of the friendliest places I've ever been a part of. Uh, in, just a few min uh, in just a few minutes, as you guys make your ways back to your seat, we're going to just kind of enter into a time where we just, we just praise God for who He is, for what He's done, and what He's going to do. So if you'll just stay standing, join me in prayer as we get our hearts and our minds ready for what God wants to, to uh, show us this morning. Father God, Lord, we just I just thank you uh, for the people in this place. I thank you for those who are willing to serve. I thank you, Father, just for what this place represents. And it's just a place of grace. It's a, a place where we come and we come face to face with you, face to face with who you are, face to face with what you've done in our lives. And I pray as everyone comes in here that everyone does feel special, that everyone finds their purpose in life and that purpose is to to, to worship you that pur purpose is to give you glory to give you honor to give you praise i pray that you just bless our time as we sing out to you in jesus name i pray amen
That's a good truth right there. If you don't know who you are, he'll show you. Just gotta ask him. Who 
you God for this truth that you are holy there's no one like you that's good for us because we're your children and our dad's on top Uh, no one stands above you Lord you hold this whole world in your hands and in all the chaos and confusion and hurt and pain you make a way for it to be heaven somehow and so I pray that you would help us find that heaven in your presence in the moments of love that we share I pray that you'd help us be better lovers of the world of the people around us not have opinions, but just to have love and kindness and grace. And um, I pray that you'd help us with these things. We place it all on your feet. May your will be done and uh, your kingdom come here in this place. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. 
Man, I'm, I am super pumped. This is one of my most exciting times of the year. I'm going to go ahead and be honest. I'm a huge football fan. I mean, I'm one of the biggest football fans that there is. And so I'm ready. I'm ready for football season. But one of the other reasons why I get excited, August is when we launch our life groups, okay? And I'm always pumped about life groups. Life groups is like an extended family. It's like a second family for me. And it's something I think is really important to, for people to find how in the world do you get connected. Okay, the other thing I really like about this point, this period of time is like school starts back. Now, I'm a little sad when school starts back, but one of the things that I do every year when school starts back is I end up buying new sneakers. Okay, now I know I just lost my southern card because I just called those sneakers instead of tennis shoes. Okay, but I don't play tennis. But I bought some new, I bought some new kicks. Pretty cool, huh? All right, one of the things that I love about these they finally made tennis shoes for old fat guys. There's no shoestrings. Look at that. I just slipped my feet right on in there. But I'll be honest with you. I've never preached in tennis shoes, but I just started teaching last week, and my age is starting to show. I was on my feet for about, I don't know, 60 hours last week, all right, before I realized I'm too old to be on my feet for 60 hours. So I had to get, some, I have to get some, something that's a little bit comfortable. But... I'll say that what happens to a lot of us, it's almost like my shoes. Sometimes we don't want to get outside our comfort zone. We want what's comfortable. And many times I think that's the reason why a lot of people, they don't want to try out life groups. It's uncomfortable. You're, you're going in, you're, you're meeting some new people, and you're going in there. What if they call on me to pray? They won't. Not yet anyway. All right? But they're not going to call on you to pray. What if they ask me a question about the Bible? They won't. Trust me on that. And the thing that you'll learn about most of those life group leaders is almost every one of those life group leaders has been in the same place that many of you guys are that's never tried it. They were in the same place. We shared last night where some of them, you know, when they first started coming, they didn't know about life groups and they were unsure about going and those types of things. Now that they started going, they met some people, they got to know some people, they got connected. Not only did they get connected, it's amazing what happened on their faith journey or with their family. And so I think it's really something that's awesome that we're going to be doing. And I'm just going to kind of give a preview of kind of where we're going um, after, after we kind of finish this sermon series that we're in about small groups. But we're going into a period of, uh, about prayer. You know, one of the things that you see in Scripture, it says that Jesus says, My house is to be called a house of prayer. And we don't spend enough time doing it. I don't spend enough time doing it. And so um, we got this church-wide book. We did this kind of last year as well with, uh, on, on a different topic. But this one's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. Okay? So it's kind of a book that, that I'm going to be going through. Life groups are going to be going through. I think they're like 10 bucks. Um, but if you want to kind of follow along and, and kind of see where it is that we're going. But one of the things we got to talking about in our life group leader meeting that we had last night is how can we make prayer more a part of our campus? And I was like, well, something that I do and it's just me, is that every morning, that every Sunday morning, I'll come in here and I'll touch every seat all the way up and down both sides of these aisles, okay? I'll just touch every row. Not every seat, but every row. And I'll pray for the people that are sitting in those. You've been prayed for. You've been prayed for. And sometimes I'll come in and I'll just sit right where the youth are sitting and just listen to the band rehearse and they think I'm probably just kind of listening to them. But I'm just really just sitting just to pray. And so I do that about between about 920 and about 935, 940. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to open it up for you guys just to come in. The band will be rehearsing. They don't mind. I promise you that. We just come in and let's just turn this place into a house of prayer before service ever starts. Okay? So if you guys want to join, we'll start that next week. We're going to be doing 28 days of prayer. And some of you might want to do, we're going to, I'm going to do 28 days of prayer and fasting. I know you look at me, fat boy's going to fast, I know, all right? But there's different kinds of fasts. I'm not doing one of those Jesus type fasts where I'm going without food and water for 40 days, okay? But I, I'm going to go without one of my favorite meals, which is breakfast. I'm going to fast for 28 days and I'm going to be praying about this town. 
I'm going to be praying about this community. I'm going to be praying for our schools, for our church, for our teachers, for our police officers. Please pray for them. I mean, I'm going to be praying for our service, men and women. But for 28 days, I'm going to kind of be really intentional and intense with my prayer life. And I think that's really, really important as we go into the fall season because I think so much is going on in our lives. Now, today I want to really talk about what, why do I consider this church or the church, Big C, so to speak, a church should be a place for everyone. For everyone. And I think throughout history, sometimes I think we kind of lose sight of that vision. Uh, our mission here at the bridge is we are to love God and love people. That's what we do. We love God and we love people. You guys hear me say this all the time. One of my little sayings, we're going to love the least, the last, the lonely, and the lost. And we're going to lead them into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our goal. That's what we are here for. But what does that mean? I think we're all on different paths on our spiritual journey. I think some people uh, have been Christ followers for a long time. Some of you are new and just got baptized and those types of things. But I think it means that for us, we love people wherever they are in their spiritual journey. Whether they're just starting out or they have become fully mature. I mean, I got caught up in this as a youth pastor one time. Is I kept thinking, man, why are my youth who are strong Christ followers, they're not leading out in school? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Why can't I get these youth all fired up? They're fired up about Jesus on Sunday. They're fired up about Jesus on Wednesday. But I had the unique experience is I saw them on Sunday, and I saw them on Wednesday in one place, but then I saw them Monday through Friday in another place. And I'm like, man, what's going on? And as I got to looking, I got to thinking about my own spiritual journey. Not mature yet. You, you love them where they're at to try to get them to where Jesus wants them to go. But they're not there yet. I had a young man come to me. And man, I am pumped about what we're about to have, what's about to happen. Young man come to me and said, I want to start a Bible study on Thursdays with a football team. On Thursdays with a football team. I want you to be in prayer for that young man. Because he's like, I've never led a Bible study before. Never done it. And I get, there ain't no better time than the present. But the thing is, when you love the heart of that young man, they're willing to step out and say, I don't have it all together. I'm not the, the super Christian, that type of thing. But I believe God's word is important. I'll be honest with you. That's the way life group works. He's starting a life group without ever knowing it. That's, he is starting a life group inside that locker room. And I praise him for that. And I'm going to help him on that journey. So I hope you guys will too. But when you came in, did you get a puzzle piece? All right, I want everybody to hold your puzzle piece up. Look at it. Everybody got their puzzle piece? If you didn't get one, there'll be some coming in the back. Really important for you to get your puzzle piece. Um, I thought about after church, we're going to go outside. We're going to go out there in the lobby and try to... No, we're not going to make the puzzle. All right? Uh, everybody try to figure out where they go. But the thing is, what do you do? Somebody bought me a puzzle. They didn't buy me this puzzle, but they bought me a puzzle for my birthday. Okay? And so they bought me this puzzle for my birthday. Now, I'm not a big puzzle guy. Okay? All right? I like the big puzzles. They have like 10 pieces and I can get it done and like really quick. I mean, that's about the attention span I have. But... I thought, man, I'm going to try this. I've never put together one of these, you know, thousand-piece puzzle type deals. So I pour it out on the kitchen table. And, and what do you do first? What? Everybody says find the outside. Okay. Well, Trey taught me something. Trey's good about teaching. I said, Trey, what do you do first? What do you do first when you uh, put the pu when you we're going to put this puzzle together? Because he was going to help me. I'm not sure how, I, didn't, I knew it wasn't going to last long, but on this thousand piece puzzle, he was going to have said, Trey, what we got to do first? He says, you got to look at the box. I was like, man, you got to look at the box. So that's the piece that we got, all right? I chose a big bunch of penguins for a reason. Y'all already know those penguins, they run around like big, huge tribes. That's what I'm looking for at a church. A bunch of penguins waddling around. No. But going to and fro, going and being part of a group. But if you think about it, when we put a puzzle together, we look at the box first. 
And the reason why we look at the box, then we get the edges. But we look at the box first because it gives us a picture of what we are trying to build. I want you to think about, as we try to build a church here, we're three years old. I tell people we're going through the toddler stage. You know, we're kind of just now getting off the bottle and man, we're starting to drink and eat real food and all that kind of stuff. And, but the thing is, every church goes through different stages. Our Lebanon campus, I always tell them, they're in their teenage years. They're having teenage issues, teenage problems, all right? We're having toddler issues, you know? In other words, trying to be able to do on our own, trying to be able to, to staff enough and have enough volunteers for all of our ministries. Just things that a young church sometimes struggles with. But when you think about what picture should we have of a church, we've got, we've got our box. We've got our picture of what church is supposed to look like. I read this verse uh, two weeks ago. And it's very unusual for me to preach on the same verse so close together. But I think it's so important for us as a church to realize that the picture on the box that we have is from the first church in Acts. That picture of what the first church did is kind of the vision that we see here at Watertown. Will you please stand as we read what Mr. Dr. Luke wrote in the book of Acts 2, 42 through 47. It says, they, talking about the first church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to what? Prayer. We present that, 28 days. There's a big reason for that. I think we do a good job with the other one. Especially in this place, we do a great job breaking bread. But everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together, they held all things in common, they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Let us pray. Father God, as we open your word and we look at what it means to, to be a church where everyone can come to, I pray that I get out of the way, you get in the way, and I pray that your word speak to us in a new and fresh way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, as a guy that's grown up in church most of my life, you know, you always say, I'm, I'm going to the church house, I'm going to the church building, and I know when we were little, you know, we taught at big church, you know, we're going to big church, which meant we were going to actually sit in those really, really uncomfortable pews, you know, that everybody had with bright red cushioning. I'm not sure what that was. Uh, I think it was for, if you didn't get out of there, that's where you were going to spend the rest of your life was with that red, like get out of the pew, get to the altar type thing. But when you think about the church, the early church, church was never meant to be a building. Never. It was meant to be people. The word that they translated church is actually a word that got mistranslated during the King James English version. The word mean is ecclesia. And ecclesia means assembly. Not building, not a place, assembly, where two or more are gathered. There am I with them also. When he says, do not neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, it is talking about meeting together in these house churches, walking alongside with your brother and sister in Christ, doing life together, doing it intentionally. But what does that look like? How can we be a picture of, of what the church is supposed to be. I think I've got four statements, four visionary statements that I think are very important for us to see. What type of church do we want to build here in week three? The first, I want this church to be known as a place where everyone is known. Everyone is known. I did something this morning I don't do a lot. I put this on. Everybody see this? 
Everybody's like, why do y'all do name tags? Okay, I did a name tag because one of the things that I put this name tag on for, and I need to do a better job and be more disciplined because every name tag has a name. A name. Every name has a story. Every story is from someone whom the Savior died for. Every name. And you'll be like, oh, everybody knows my name. I'll guarantee you there's someone in here that doesn't know your name. In fact, I see it all the time. Somebody said, and if they're like me, I'm terrible with names, okay? I've met 900 Ashleys in my life. Trust me, okay? As a teacher, I've met a ton of Brandons. In other words, they all start to run together if I'm not careful. But the reason why this is important is because I want this place to be a place where everyone is known. There was an old TV show, I think it was in the 90s. I think it was in the 90s. But there was an old TV show where the place was called Cheers. It was a bar. And one of the things about that song, it's where everyone knows your name. Why did people keep coming? Because everyone knew their name. Do you know why people will come to church? Because people know their name. I know it sounds silly. But when people know your name, when people know that you want to know their name, they're more than likely to want to be a part. We do the name tags for a reason. One is so everyone, I mean, it makes a big difference when I go and shake your hand. Hi, Brad, okay? I can go, hi, Robert. I can go, hi, whoever. I can actually put a name, and pretty soon I'll get to know that name. And once you know someone's name, it's a whole lot easier to start to have a conversation. It just is. I mean, that's one of the things that I think makes us unique. It makes us different. But I want to be a place where every person is known. There was a staff member at a church, and there was a a marriage that was in crisis. It was in a mess. And the husband and wife, they called the church office, which is what every husband and wife will do. They'll call the church office, say, my marriage is messed up. And what we'll generally do is, One of the staff people, they'll come, they'll meet with the couple, and they'll sit down and they'll begin to counsel with the couple. Now, sometimes I'll do, I'll counsel with a couple and I'll realize, man, this is way above my education, okay? And I'll send them the branches. But in other cases, it's just simply something that they need a group of people to go alongside and work with them in this marriage situation that they had. And the staff person said, how long have you been coming how long have you been coming to uh, this church? And they said, two years. Okay, well, I think what y'all need to do is you need to call up the life group that you're a part of. We don't have a life group. Okay, no big deal. Let's call, call two or three people that you know in the church to come over your house and pray with you and pray with us. And they looked at him and said, we don't know anybody. This was a church of 5,000 people. They didn't know anybody. And he looked at them and said, the issue with your marriage, y'all don't know anybody. It has nothing to do with y'all two. Y'all are being picked off because that's what, that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to come in. And see, he can come in. He can divide us when we're isolated. Man, you get a bunch of Holy Spirit-filled Christ followers in your house, in, over your marriage, and in your living room, the devil has a hard time getting through the door. He can't get through the door, okay? You get some ladies, I mean, wrapping their arms around you and loving on you, and guess what they did? That, pa- that staff member said, I can do a lot for you, but I can't do as much as just getting some Holy Spirit-filled Christ followers in your living room. He called up a life group leader and said, hey, I got this couple. Come on over. They came over. That life group came. They adopted this couple. They saved that marriage. They helped that marriage get saved. Why? Because everyone needs a place where they are known. I want this to be a place where you're known. Everyone wants to know your name. Everyone knows that when people are known, that is when relationships start to build. And when you think about Life groups outside, we have the life group table set up. 
There's a bunch of people out there. They want you in their house. They want to be involved in your life. You know, two-thirds of everything Jesus commanded us to do involves one another. You can't do it by yourself. Two-thirds of what Jesus commands us to do as Christ followers involves one another. Love one another. Encourage one another. Bear one another's uh, burdens. Pray for one another. Serve one another. I mean, you, there's a hundred. A hundred verses that use the word one another. And I think the reason why is because we were not designed to be Lone Ranger Christians. We're not, we, we were not designed to be alone. Find a group of people. We all need someone in our lives. But everyone is known. The next one is where everyone is loved. I want this place to be a place where everyone is known and everyone is loved. It says, now all the believers were together and they held all things in common. Now, growing up, I said, and I, and I use a lot of illustrations. I know it has to do with sports. It's all I really know is sports, and I don't know fishing, but I do like it. But the thing is, is that I am a huge Dallas Cowboys fan, okay? I do not know how I became a huge Dallas Cowboy fan because no one else in my family is a Dallas Cowboys fan. And I've been one since I was little. I even bought Tony Dorsett tennis shoes that had a zipper on the side of them, okay? Because I wanted to be cool. And the thing is, I, somebody's like, you liked them because they were winners. I was cheering for them when Danny White was quarterback. So believe me, they weren't winners, okay? But the thing is, I have continued to be a fan through 0-10 seasons, through Super Bowls, all right? I mean, these, these are my guys. These are my dudes. Well, one of my best friends, ministry friend, he's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Can I tell you that Pittsburgh Steelers fans and Dallas Cowboy fans do not really care for one another a whole lot? Because we had this whole Super Bowl ring thing going on. You know, I'll say, hey, we won two Super Bowls. And he'd be like, yeah, we won a bunch, okay? In other words, we've won the most, okay, until the Patriots kind of took over. But the thing is... He and I didn't have all things in common. We argue all the time about sports teams and who we liked and who we didn't like. And I remember growing up, one of the things that used to happen uh, at, uh, my dad was involved in the youth group. All the youth were Tennessee fans. My dad was a Vanderbilt fan. After every UT ball game, I was going to find a whole bunch of oranges in our driveway. They would orange my dad's house. They oranged him. Okay? I don't even know if that was a thing, but they would just dump oranges all the way down the driveway. They haven't been able to do that in about three years, though. Just letting you know. All right? Not hurting nobody's feelings. But the thing is, when we look at that, we don't have things in common. But can I say this? When my good friend, who's a huge Pittsburgh fan, dude, he got a parasite in his eye. And for six months, couldn't work. Couldn't go outside. Had to wear eye patch. Spent most of his time in pain, going to doctors. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. All of his stuff that he was kind of having the journey through. And just last week, his mom passes away. Can I tell you, whether we were a Pittsburgh fan or a Dallas fan, we had something in common. We loved one another. And that's what mattered when we look at what we have in common. We might not look like each other, and I believe me, the guy that I'm talking about, I don't look nothing like him, okay? He's tatted from his toes to his fingertips. He's got a beard that goes down to his belly button, okay? And I told him he looked kind of cool like a pirate with his eye patch on. But the thing is, if you saw both of us walking down the street, like, there's no way them dudes are friends and we're best friends. We're best friends. When it says we have all things in common, we don't look alike. We don't even hardly come from the same background. We definitely don't like the same sports teams at all, okay? But man, we love the same Jesus with everything that we got. And that's what matters. That's what matters. Everyone is known. Everyone is loved. What would happen if we just loved one another? In John 13, 34, it says, I give you a new command. Jesus speaking, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. Now, I like this. It don't say, love one another because they're good. 
Love one another because they don't sin. Love one another because they look like you. Love, there, there's no blank at the end of this. It's a period. A period. Man, we get so caught up and man, if I'm not careful, I'm going to love one another as long as they look like me, act like me, talk like me, and be like me. But man, what about them people that are hard to love? We still got to love them. Because it says love one another. Because Jesus died for that person just like he died for me. And so we are called to love one another. So a church where everyone is loved, where everyone is known, and where everyone is needed. It says they sowed their possessions and their property. They distributed the proceeds as all had need. See, I think there's two places where everyone is needed. We're, we are needed to support. I love how the early church, they sold everything they had. They gave as people had need. This is what I think is cool about that. They gave when they had, so when they didn't have, they could receive from the church. Does that make sense? They, get, they gave when they had because there was going to become a time where they didn't have. See, most people don't know. These people didn't have 401ks. Okay? In other words, when crops were good, they had a lot. When crops were bad, they had none. So they gave to the church when they had excess. So when there was time where they didn't, the church could give back. That, that's why we give. We give so we could give it away. One of the things, and I tell you, I am the, I'm the biggest sucker for this, and I'll continue being a sucker for it, and I'll apologize to you. You guys give generously, but man, when somebody comes in, I, they ain't got no food, I go get groceries. I feed them. I use the offer money to do it. I feed them. When somebody comes in and there's a fire, and they said, man, I'm having a hard time. What do you need? Well, I need this, this. Here you go. Now, one of the cool things is I don't give them cash. I give them a gift card to Walmart, okay, where I know they have to at least go to Walmart. One of the things I used to do, I, used, I bought a bunch of Subway gift cards because for whatever reason, man, homeless guys can pick me out of a crowd. I'm telling you, when I walk down the street, homeless guy is going to find me. He's going to walk up to me, and he's going to say, hey, buddy, and I'm going to talk back. It's just my, hey, what's going on? It's amazing, though, when you start talking about these guys. We judge them first before we ever hear their story. You know, we automatically assume they're going to go buy alcohol, they're going to buy drugs. We, we just assume that. Man, it could be a guy that, man, he, maybe, maybe he got hurt at work. And the place that he worked didn't carry workman's compensation. Now, he can't get a job because what he did was manual labor and now he can't work. Maybe, maybe you need to sit down and find out what their story. Maybe they were in the military Okay? And, man, something happened in the military, and when they've got out, they've just lost everything. We don't know their story. And so I used to carry away subway cars just so I could give it to them. So one of the things you're needed is your support, and we'll take up the tithe in just a minute. But I think we're also needed to serve. We're needed to serve. None of this happens without people that are willing to come and set up and to serve. And the reason why we serve is because one of the things that you see is that Jesus came, he said, I came to serve. One of the coolest things is right before he went to the cross, he washed the disciples' feet. The one who could speak creation into existence got on his hands and his knees and washed a bunch of dirty, nasty feet. It just blows my mind that Jesus has called, called us to serve. Called us to serve. And when you look at this puzzle, peace. If we were to go out and, and put this puzzle, maybe put it up on the wall, one, it's going to look like that right there, like, like a bunch of penguins, okay? Some of y'all, this is where some of y'all are. Y'all looking sideways and all that kind of stuff. But we, we would put this puzzle together. If we took all of our pieces and we put them up and we decided that we're going to make this puzzle and we decide we're going to put it on this wall. So we go over there and we put each puzzle piece on the wall. Well, if somebody said, you know what? I like my puzzle piece. This is my puzzle piece. Mine. I am not going to go put it on that wall. 
Okay? And they stuck it in their pocket and they walked out of here. Would we be able to finish the puzzle? Would we? We would not. In fact, I've never seen this. And one of the things that our house is, man, it's the most frustrating thing ever. So you get one of those thousand piece puzzles. Okay? And again, Trey was helping me put this puzzle together. And you start to finish the puzzle and you start realizing, uh-oh, I'm missing some pieces. I'm missing some pieces. Well, guess what? All of those other puzzle pieces aren't going to miraculously fill in for that missing piece. When you think about us as a church, man, when you're not here, we're missing a piece that makes us who we are. When you're not serving, we're missing a piece that makes us who we are. We're missing that special piece. And that special piece is you. You are uniquely gifted and talented for a purpose, for a place that only you can fill. Only you. Not all of us are gifted teachers. Not all of us are gifted communicators. Not all of us are gifted musicians. Not all of us are gifted in technology back there. Okay, they, somebody said one time, TJ ought to know how to do that. I didn't even know how to turn the doggone thing on. Okay, I was looking for on switch. Where's the on button? All right, I can maybe cut it on. But the thing is, every piece is important to this place. Every piece. There's a setup piece. Okay, one of the things that I do, one of the things that I did this morning, and then we laughed about it, okay, because we hang these curtains, big, huge blue curtains. They have magnets that stick up there. And so I'm at the top of this ladder, okay? And I had to go get a big ladder because the first ladder they had, I got to the top and went, I don't quite make it. I can't do this job. Why? I wasn't gifted for this job. I cannot do this job, okay? Now, I went and got a bigger ladder because I got tired of doing, like, I can't do, all right, I can't do this. So I went and got a bigger ladder. All right? So I can get all the way up to the ceiling. Why? Because right now, okay, I'm dealing with a, with a little bit of a health issue. I can't pick up stuff like I used to. But, man, I can take a magnet and stick it to the metal. And stick it to metal and stick it to metal. All the way around. And somebody says, why is that important? Because when people go now and drop their babies off, they're not looking at a nasty school wall. They're looking at something that's clean. That they want to drop their kids off so they could come in here and experience Jesus without trying to wrestle a baby. Because if they come to church with their baby, they're not listening to the message, they're wrestling the baby. And y'all have seen that. And so every piece, I want you guys to take this piece and I want you to think about where can I best serve this place? Maybe it's leading a small group. Maybe it's helping in student ministry. Maybe it's helping in our kids ministry. We need some people down there. Okay, I'll be honest with you. We don't need teachers in the kids' ministry. We need bouncers. I'm serious. We need one just to be a keeper of the gate. We need somebody that could, this would be the ability. If you could do this, you could serve in the kids' ministry. All right, they take a tag. Every parent gets a tag. The tag has a number on it or a name. Take the tag off of the kid. Take the tag from the parent and go match. That would be serving. That would be one of the serve. We need people that's going to come and hand out donuts, okay? They don't put me in that job because I go, one for me, one for you, okay? That wouldn't be my giftedness. What's your puzzle piece? Are we going to be a place where everyone is known? Be a place where everyone is loved. Be a place where everyone is needed and has their special place. But lastly, I want to be known as a place where everyone is changing. It's changing. The early church, they prayed, they fasted, they loved. And I love this. Acts 2, 47. I love this one. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If we're not about the saving business, we don't need to be in the church business, period. We need to be about the saving business, Saving people who are lost. Saving people who are lonely. Saving people who have been forgotten. We need to be a church that is about reaching people with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. I love how it said there were no needy among them. Here's how many people that basically lives has been changed. Okay? 
I am going to do something that is going to make a lot of people in here uncomfortable, okay? I'm going to go ahead and preface that. The band's going to come up and, and they're going to play a little bit, but I'm going to make some people uncomfortable. If you would say that this church has been a place that has made a change in you, a change in your kids, or a change in your family, I want you to stand up. That's something to celebrate. Look at that. That's something to celebrate. This is why we're here. I have to be, I have to stand. One of the things when we first got married is that we were involved in a church and we were actually involved in ministry, but we noticed something. We were stuck. We were stuck. We, we weren't moving forward. When we found this place, we found a place where everyone is loved. Every person was important. But we want to be a place where everyone is changing. Have we got there yet? No. Have we arrived yet? No. But praise Jesus that we're always in a place where change can happen. That we're in a place where everyone is known, a place where everyone is loved, a place where everyone is needed, and a place where everyone is changing. You might say, I can't go to that life group. I'm, mess I'm, I'm dealing with some stuff. Everyone in that life group is dealing with some stuff. That, what better place to go deal with our stuff than here with a Savior who died for all of our stuff. He died for all of our sin. He, he went to a cross for the sole purpose of saving us, of changing us. Of making us new, new creatures. The old is gone. The new has come to make us more like Him. I want us to bow our heads and maybe you've been coming for a while and you say, you know what? I, I need a change. If you'd say, you know what? I need a change. I'm not where I need to be. Would you just raise your hand? You said, I'm not where I need to be. Good. Hands everywhere. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to just kind of repeat this prayer. It's not a magical prayer. But I just want you to repeat this prayer. Father God, I know I'm not where I need to be. Thank you for grace to get me to where you want me to go. I pray that you will help me change. I pray that you will Help me to keep changing. I pray that you will allow me to be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
your feet my desires and dreams I lay down changing to be more like Jesus. Can we just give him a hand for that? That's just awesome. I want to thank you guys. If you just have a seat, our ushers are going to come come down to take our offering. While they're taking the offering, there's a short video. But before they show that, I want you to, to know that all of our life group leaders will be out in the lobby. Make sure you stop, shake their hand. They should have a business card about what day and what time that they're meeting. Also, students, come tonight, bring a friend. Bring a friend. Here's a short announcement video.